Hello everyone, welcome to episode 30 of Data Programming 1. Uh, today is Monday, April 6th, and I hope everyone is doing well and is staying as safe as they can be. I've replaced the cable in my microphone, so hopefully the audio quality will be back up to uh, where we like it to be. Um, and with that in mind, my son is here in the background. He's playing video games on the other computer. Uh, I do. He does have headphones on, making him wear those. But if you do happen to hear the sounds of gunfire or creepers blowing up, no need to call for help. He's just busy saving us from zombies. All right, so today we're going to be talking about part two of Pandas. If you haven't watched the video from part one, during the third five weeks of this course, you can pretty much watch these uh, uh, the, the topics in any order. They're not dependent on one another. But if you haven't watched uh, Pandas 1 yet, I highly recommend doing that before coming back to Pandas 2. Don't skip that one. All right. Please remember that Pandas is a really powerful Python module for working with tables of data. And um, we're in the third section of the course where we've got really four core topics which focus on data science. And this is definitely one of them, Pandas, but also the web, databases, and plotting. So that's kind of where we are just in an overview. Uh, so as we look in at Pandas, Pandas introduces two brand new data types for us, the series and the data frame. Last time we covered the series. Uh, just a quick review of Pandas series. It's, it's a lot like a dictionary, but it's a dictionary with the e keys that are ordered and given an integer uh, position, uh, like a list. So it's a combination of a dictionary and a list in a lot of ways. And in uh, Pandas series, those dictionary keys would be called indexes. So it's a little bit confusing with the fact that a list would also have an index. Um, and those positions uh, corresponding to the list uh, index are going to be known as integer positions. So last time we looked at creating series uh, from both lists and from dictionaries. We talked about accessing the data with location, or lock, LOC, the integer position, ILOC, just straight up using the brackets and letting pandas figure out whether we're talking about an index or an integer position, um, and slicing. Uh, we also covered element-wise operations. So a lot of series operations, we can do arithmetic, and it works like a math vector. Um, we can do relational operations, and that's going to give us Boolean values, and even Boolean operations. But we have to remember we've got special symbols for those. We can't just write and, not, and or. We've got to use the ampersand, the pipe, and the tilde. Uh, we also talked about data alignment, and I've got another quick review of that coming up in a moment. Um, and finally, uh, the super powerful Boolean series for pulling out um, exactly what we want from a series. Uh, we're also going to see all of these things also work the same for data frames, which are essentially tables made up of series. All right, but I want to start us off with um, a worksheet. There was at least one Piazza post requesting a worksheet for lectures. And I think having some problems to go through as a way to test yourself to see if you really did get what was in the lecture and uh, see if it sunk in or maybe if you need to review something, it's really valuable to have a worksheet with some questions to just go through and test yourself. So let me pull that up for you guys. One sec. Okay, here we are on our web page. Um, you can see we are in week 12 on Pandas 2. The link to the worksheet is right here. So I'm just going to open this up. It's going to open up a PDF document. Here it is. We've got page one uh, addressing series, and then page two will be more about data frames. So uh, let's start off, take a look at this. Um, normally when I pull out a worksheet like this, I like to do at least one of the problems in class. And I think uh, just to make this feel a little bit more like a class experience, let's go ahead and do this. So pause the video, go to the web page, print this out, and then come right back. Okay, I'm back. Let's take a look at this. Um, question one is just creating a series and then looking at some of the, can we predict what these functions will give us? It's looking like uh, data access. Question two, I've got another series. Uh, this one created from a list and uh, yeah, I'm getting up more data access, some arithmetic operations. Let's do this one. Let's do number three. This is the one with the cool uh, Boolean series in it. So I'm going to pause the video here. I'm going to copy all of these items over into a Jupyter Notebook so that I don't have to like print this out and come up with a document camera. I don't have a document camera. So I'm going to be typing everything. And then that way you guys can actually read what I'm writing. So let me pause the video, go copy these, and I will be right back. All right, guys, I'm back. 
Uh, I've gone ahead and copied problem three into a Jupyter Notebook, so we can go ahead and talk about this. Uh, first up, I'm going to run this top cell, and that's just going to make the screen wider so that I can zoom in, make everything as large as possible. So if you are trying to watch this on a mobile device, it's the best it can be. Okay, so at this point, um, we're creating a series from a list with elements negative 1, 1, 200, 191, and 4, storing that into V. Now, as I go through this, I'm not going to actually run any of these cells. I'm counting on you guys to pull this up yourself and run it on your own. But I just want to talk about this. We'll talk about the strategy as we think about things and look at what we're going through. Okay, so this first one, uh, V less than 0. That's going to take the series. It's a relational operator, the less than sign. And so every time I use a, a relational operator of any kind, I'm going to get back a Boolean value. And in this case, when I'm using a series, I'm going to get back a Boolean series. And it's going to be element-wise. So I'm going to take this first element in the series, negative 1, and ask myself, is it less than 0? And that's true. And then the next four, it looks like, are all greater than 0. So we're going to get false, 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 and false. So those are going to be the values. Now, if you remember, a Boolean series also has these integer positions that it's going to print out, or an index. And in this case, when we're creating a series with a list, the integer position and the index, or the dictionary key parallel, they're going to be the same. So we'll start us off with 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. And that's what it's going to look like when it prints out a Boolean series. There will be one more line with the data type. Uh, I'm going to skip that for right now. Okay, let's take a look at this next one. So the first thing we're going to do is... Uh, this is an arithmetic operation on the left, the v times v, and this will happen element-wise. So as I go through this, I'm going to get, let's see, negative 1 times negative 1 is going to be positive 1, and then 1 times 1 is going to be 1, 200 times 200 is 40,000, uh, yeah, I'm good at math and all, but 191 times 191 is just a big number, we'll come back to that in a sec. And 4 times 4 is 16. All right. Now, the second part of this is taking this resulting series, with which has all these integers in it, and asking, is it exactly equal to 1? Okay, now, here I've got a relational operator, the exactly equals thing. And so this is going to give my um, Boolean values back. So in this case, is 1 exactly equal to 1? Um, it is. So I'm going to take this out and write true. Is 1 exactly equal to 1? True. And now 40,000 is not false. And this is the reason I don't care what number this really is. I just know, need to know that it's not equal to 1. So false. And 16 is not equal to false. And then, uh, same as before, this will be element 0. 1, 2, 3, and 4. All right. Very good. I'm going to grab and copy my list so that it's actually on the screen for this next problem right here. All right, let's take a look at this one. So the first thing that we're going to be doing, uh, well, overall, we've got a Boolean series V, and we are going to be accessing, see I've got the square brackets there, so I'm accessing that list. And I'm going to be accessing it with a Boolean series created by this expression. So let's take a look at that very first part, that innermost V greater than or equal to 100. No, nope, greater than 100. All right, so I'm going to take a look at each one of these elements and ask, is it greater than 100? So let's create that Boolean series first. So negative 1 is not, 1 also not, 200 is greater than 100, 191, yes, and 4, not greater than 100. So this is the Boolean series that I'm going to use as I decide whether I'm going to include the elements of V in my answer. So I'm going to go through next and... When I produce this answer for the composite, the access uh, of V with this Boolean series here, this is going to be whether, do I include this number or not? And so for the first one, the negative one, the answer is false. I do not include it. For this one, I do not include it because that one is false. Then the next two are true, so 200 and 191. I'm going to include both of those. So 200, 191. And finally, this last answer, false, is um, not present. Okay, and one other little detail I just want to highlight 
very quickly here, um, the index. So when I create this list, let me, let me just take a look at the list itself, minus 1, 1, 200, 191, and 4. They are assigned indexes based on their position. So this is going to be at index uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, let me make this all fit on the screen. When I go through the list and access it with uh, the Boolean series, those um, indexes uh, are retained. So the 200 here is actually at index 2, and that will be retained. I'm going to take a look at 191, that index 3 will also be retained. So this is going to be my final answer right here. Alright, and this was just all the work I went through to get to this final answer. First talking about which elements needed to be in the series, and then what their actual index will be. Alright, excellent. Let me take a look at another one. I'm going to copy my series, so I've got a copy of it right here on the screen. And now this is going to be a three-step problem here. First, I'm accessing a list, so I'm only going to be creating a subset of this list right here. To do that, I'm going to be using the list mod 2. So this is going to do, this is an arithmetic operation. I'm going to get a list of well, ones and zeros. And then I'm going to ask, are those exactly equal to zero? So this is sort of my odd even test right here. And this will give me a Boolean value for true and false. So I'm creating a Boolean series to use to access the list. So let's take a look at this. Okay, so minus one, uh, is that odd or even? So when I apply mod 2 to that, I'm going to get 1 because it's not even. All right, 1 mod 2, also not even. It's going to give me a remainder of 1. 200 mod 2 is even, so the remainder will be 0. 191, oh, whoops, whoops, there it is, it's on 5. Uh, it's going to have a remainder of 1. And then 4 mod is equal to zero because it is even. All right, once I've done all of those, that's this much right here. The next thing I'm going to do is ask, are any of those exactly equal to zero? So in this case, um, that is not, so I'll get false and false. True for the 200, false for 191 and true for the fourth one, for number four. Okay, now, once I have that Boolean series, I can go back and create my final answer. So V, with this Boolean series accessed, is gonna give me the values uh, 200 and four. And let me just go through and put in my keys. There we go. So those are my keys, and I retain the key, I'm sorry, not keys, they're indexes because I'm a series now. We're going to retain the keys from before, so I'll have 2 and 4 for the keys. There we go, final answer. Okay, and then for this final one, let me again copy my series V down into the cell so that we can look at it. I'm going to be asking uh, two questions here. This question right here, v greater than 0, is going to give me a Boolean series because it's a relational operator. This v less than 100 will also give me a Boolean series. It's a relational operator. And then uh, we'll be taking those Boolean values and using the AND operator to combine them into a single Boolean series, which we'll use to access the list here. Okay, so I'm going to go through this and ask first, is v greater than 0? Um, negative 1 is not. That'll be false. The rest of these will all be true. There we go. True, 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 true. All right, this is going to be the first Boolean series for the v greater than 0. My next question is v less than 100. So negative 1 is definitely less than 100. So I'll get a true there. 1 less than 100. 200 not less than 100, the 191, not less than 100, 
and 4 is less than 100. So I've got two Boolean series. I tried to line them up a little bit with what they're under. Maybe I can move that over one more. Okay, and then the combination of these. Uh, false and true is going to give me false. True and true will be true. True and false is false. True and false is false. And true and true is true. Okay, so this is my composite Boolean series. Um, and then finally, I can go and compose my final answer. So the values uh, we're going to be extracting are going to be the second one, which is the number one right there, and the, the last answer, which is four. And the indices will be index one and index four. All right, very good. All right, guys, welcome back. So the next topic that I want to talk about is one of the little nuances, one of the little things that uh, behaves a little weird with the data alignment with relational operators. So let me just real quick pull together an example. Uh, X is equal to a panda series. We'll make it a dictionary. So now I can add in my first key, and then a number, and then B, and another number. Okay, so I have X, and then I'm going to create two more series with the exact same keys. So there'll be dictionaries with keys A um, and B, so with values 2 and 3, and then third one. In this case, all I'm going to do is switch these. B is still going to be 3, and A is still going to be 2, but they're going to be at a different position. I've swapped the order. So this will, in series 1, A will be at integer position 0, and in series 2, uh, B will be at integer position 0. All right? Um, let me just run this. That didn't do anything. Oh, holy cow. All right, hold on, hold on. If we import pandas, uh, and then I don't just want to import it, I want to be able to shortcut it as pd. And then one more thing, I also want from pandas import, I want series, so I don't have to type pd at all uh, for series. And I also want data frame, that's the topic coming up next. Okay, there we go. Now, still into, oh, I want to print these out. Hold on. I got this. I totally know what I'm doing. Print x s1 and s2. Okay, just want to make sure they're all looking good. Yep, we've got a and b, a and b, and then b and a for x, s1, and s2. Okay, so when we use um, these for arithmetic operations, like if I want to multiply these together, x times s1 is done element-wise, it's no problem. I'm going to take the 10 here from x, the 2 there, and I get 20. The 100 times 3 is 300. When I do x times s2, even though I've switched a and b around, they're still the same number. I should get the same answer. So in this case, I'm taking a is 10 times a is 2. I still get 20. So it's going to automatically align those uh, data values for me. It's going to grab the index a and multiply by index a. Now when I do relational operators, like less than, for example, if I take x is less than s1 and run this, so in this case, x of a is 10, and s1 of a is 2, so is 10 less than 2? Um, 10 is not less than 2, I get false. All right, excellent. Um, however, when they're in the wrong order, or if I've switched the order around, uh, Pandas doesn't actually take the time to do this alignment like we would like um, if I just use the standard less than operator. Instead, it's going to give me a value error. So this doesn't work. I get a value error. I'm going to get rid of that error message. So the way I really need to do this, um, for and, and Pandas used to work. That it used to be just fine. It would do all of the, um, the uh, index alignment for me. And take care of that. What they've done though is they've created um, special functions that apply to series. So x of less than is lt, and then I have to give it an argument s2, 
And now this is going to go ahead and do that data alignment for me when I call the function LT. Um, LT stands for less than. Um, and then just uh, real quick, the others, uh, we have greater than. We have equals. We'll have x um, greater than or equal to, x less than or equal to, and x not equal to. So all of those, you know, let me put some comments in, greater than, equal, equal, not equal. Okay, so all of those um, are the codes we can use to force data alignment to happen. Now I think the reason they did this was for performance. If you do a lot of these less than comparisons, if it happens every time through a loop or something, it's got to frequently go through and do that data alignment step. What they would really prefer for performance is we actually sorted our own keys out. So we could do something like um, s2 dot sort index and run that and that's going to go ahead and rearrange these indexes a and b so they're in the right order and if we sort the indexes for all of the systems then i can just save this into a variable uh i only have to do the sorting once and then all of the data alignment just happens automatically and so then the less than operator will not give me an error so i just want to spend a minute and um, talk about this we'll need this for um, the upcoming lab um, and project Next up, I want to start talking about data frames. A data frame is one of the two core data structures introduced by Pandas, the other one being the series. And a data frame is just a table. Um, one way to think about it is that it's a table where the columns are exactly like series. And in fact, one of the ways that we can make a data frame is by just stitching together a bunch of series. So for example, um, if I have column one is equal to a series, and I'm going to make that series from a list, a list and we'll put in uh, four names so there we go we've got four names we'll have Alice Bob Cindy and Dan okay and just make sure that worked there we go there's my series okay next up column two series and let's give them all scores so we'll have Alice get six points seven eight nine just so we have some nice numbers in a row and then let's take a look at that make sure it worked column two excellent looking good six seven eight nine as a series so next up to make a data frame um, data frame uh, constructor needs the parentheses I'm gonna make this from a dictionary with those two columns as values and the keys for those their names and that's going to be column one and scores as the key and that'll be column two okay I've got some nice formatting in there there's no reason I can't spread that out to make it easy to read um, and when I do that I need to remember the comma this is like my third take on this and I have never remembered that comma but once I get it in there, things are looking good. I've now created the data frame. So check this out. My series for the first column is right here, Alice, Bob, Cindy, Dan. Uh, the header for that is the actual key that I've used from the dictionary that I used to create this data frame. Same deal with scores. I've got six, seven, eight, nine from series uh, column two. And the key for the dictionary that I created scores uh, is right here as the header. So data frames also give us uh, the ability to use integer position to access the rows. So it's telling us that right here I've got row 0, row 1, row 2, row 3, just like we had with the series. It was giving us those sort of built-in indexes when we use lists to create them. Um, and the integer position was kind of hidden from us, but that's essentially what this is right here, and it's providing that. Yeah, so it turns out we can make uh, data frames from pretty much any combination of dictionaries of dictionaries or dictionaries of lists or lists of lists or lists of dictionaries. And uh, we don't actually need to go through the extra step of making a series. So for example, let me just copy this down in the next row here. And we'll make a data from, from a dictionary of lists. 
So in this case, I'm going to create the exact same data frame. So in this case, I don't need the series. I'm just going to create a dictionary with the list as the entry and a list as the other entry. And this is going to work the same way. I'm going to still get the column where I've labeled the column with these dictionary keys. And my values now come from a list instead of from a series. OK, so there is the dictionary of lists. We can also use a list of lists to make a data frame. It's going to look a little different. Um, so in this case, I've got my data frame. And I'm going to be giving it a list. And let me put this one up here. I'm creating a list. So there's the opening bracket, the closing bracket. And then my values here are going to be lists. And I'm going to remember the commas this time. Right, there we go. And so my list here is going to contain the values, Alice, and then her score. So basically, it's the row of the table that I want. Bob and his score. Wait, Bob, it was five, six, seven, eight. All right, then Cindy and her score. And Dan scoring nine points. So when I do this, I'm getting the same table. Please notice that when I use lists of lists in this manner, uh, I'm not actually able to give it any header information. So the column indexes and the row indexes are just going to be numbers that it's used from their position. So the, the names here come from position 0 of the lists, and 6, 7, 8, 9, the scores come from position 1. I'll talk about how to rename those in just a minute. Another way to make a data frame is to use a dictionary of dictionaries. Okay, and in this case, we again need to do this a little bit differently. Creating a data frame, data frame, smooth parentheses there. It's going to be a dictionary of dictionaries. So in this case, my key is going to be the column index. So I'll have name, and then I'll have a dictionary as the entry, comma there, and then I'll have score for the other column, and the dictionary here, uh, I need to be able to use keys to identify where all of the data elements go. And in this case, I'm going to just label my rows A, B, C, and D. So row A will contain Alice as the first name. Row B will contain Bob. Row C will contain Cindy. And row D will contain the name Dan. Okay, same deal with the scores. In fact, I'm going to cheat a little bit. Copy and paste some of this so I don't have to type as much. We'll get rid of Alice. She scored six points. Bob got seven. Cindy got eight. And Dan got nine. Whoa, Dad. I meant Dan. All right, let's check that out. Where did I forget the commas? Ooh, no missing commas. Looking good. Okay, so in this case, notice it's a little bit different. So because I was able to give all of these um, dictionary entries uh, a key, it uses those keys to label the rows instead of just coming up with its own positional integer to label the rows. Okay, last possible combination to create a data frame is the list of dictionaries. So creating a data frame, I need the it's a gener uh, constructor, so I need the parentheses. And then I'm creating a list. And inside that list, I'm going to create uh, several dictionaries. Dictionaries. OK. Now, the keys for these are going to be the column headers. So I have name. We'll give uh, Alice. and scores. She scored six points, and that's not how you make a dictionary. I need the colon. So that'll be my first entry. And then I'm going to cheat a little bit, copy and paste some of this stuff. Just change it. So we've got Bob, Cindy, Dan, and I need seven, eight, and nine. When I do this, I go ahead and I get uh, the exact same um, data frame that I've been working with all along. I've got column names, 
our column headers, uh, column indexes, index is probably the best word, and um, scores. All right, next up, um, please notice that table I just made gave me those integer positions for the row indexes, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. If I want, I can relabel those to anything I desire. Um, and to do that, it's pretty simple. Let me just copy this data frame construction right here. This is a renaming the rows. So right here I've created my data frame using the constructor, that's the parentheses. This one is a list of dictionaries. And after that list of dictionaries is completed, uh, data frame actually takes another argument. This is a keyword argument, index. And this is where I can label the index of each of the rows. So in this case, I'm going to label the first row A, second row B, third row C, and the fourth row D. Uh, there we go. Now I have clearly named rows A, B, C, and D with values Alice, Bob, Cindy, Dan under the name column and their scores. Okay, now that we've seen lots of different ways to create data frames, both from series and then four different combination of lists and dictionaries, let's talk real quick about data access or if I want to read one of the values from my table. And I want to start off with a quick review of accessing uh, values from series. So I'm going to scroll up and just grab a series from up here somewhere. I think I had, yep, there it is. Here's my favorite series, Alice, Bob, Cindy, and Dan. And uh, I'm going to plop this down right here, check out what it looks like. Um, well, this is almost what I want. Instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch this around a little bit so that I'm going to be using the names as keys and we'll give them some scores. So I'm going to switch this from a list creation series to the dictionary version of creating a series. Eight and Dan scored nine points. There we go. So now these will be my keys and the numbers here will be the scores that they have uh, earned. Okay. So first up, if I wanted to uh, access uh, Bob's score, for example, I'm going to hit column one. I'm going to use the location, and I'm going to give it uh, the keyword Bob, or the index Bob. And that's going to go ahead and retrieve this value right here. All right, very good. The second way we learned how to do this was with uh, uh, integer location. In this case, all I need to do is give it uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, which row I want. So if I want to grab Cindy's score, that's 0, 1, 2. She scored 8 points. There we go, 8 points. Um, and then we also had just straight up column 1 brackets. And hope that pandas can figure out which row I'm talking about, or which element in the series. In this case, so if I use Cindy, uh, it knows which one to look for. And if I use position one, it also figures out what to look for. So in this case, it always chooses, it looks through all of the existing indexes to see if it's there. And if it's not there, it checks to see if it's an integer. And then if it's an integer, it goes through and uses that to figure out which row I want. So it prioritizes the key, uh, the index. Okay, so we're going to find that accessing values in a data frame is very similar. So let me go grab a data frame. How about this one right here. There we go. And I'm actually going to store this in a variable. It's an object just like everything else in Python. So we'll print that out to see that it hasn't changed. So df stands for data frame in this case. Now if I want to access something, I can use the same um, actually hold on a second. That's not the one I want. I want the one where I've labeled the indexes. I want the good one with like all the details. Let me just real quick pop that in here. There we go. Now I've got the rows labeled with keys and we'll be able to use integers. All right, so if I want to access things from this, I'm still going to do the location. And in this case, I'm going to give it a row. So we'll take a look at row A. That should give me the values from Alice. So in this case, the type of this Oops, typo there. This is actually a pandas series, so I've got the keys or the index name 
which it's going to steal from the name, uh, the index header up here, the index of the column and scores, and the values are Alice and six. So by just doing a location, this version uh, is going to access things by rows. The the uh, designers of Pandas had a choice. They could say that this is going to be the column, or it's going to be the row, um, and they went ahead and chose row for this. Um, so the next example, um, we also have an I location or an integer location. In that case, if I want to grab the Bob row, he's in zero one. I can do that. This is also going to give me row data. So dot location, dot I location, both give me rows. And in fact, the uh, I location also works with negative indices. Uh, so in this case, if I want the last row or Dan, I can just do uh, negative one integer and lock that up. Okay, now where things get a little different is that if I do uh, data frame with just the square brackets and not the location or integer location, this is going to give me a column. So in this case, I need to go back and grab the column header, and this will return the column data as a series. So over here, it's getting the keys from the names of the rows and the values from the values in that column. I can do the same thing with my other column, which I think I named scores. Is plural, right? Yes, it was. And now this will retrieve all the scores for me. Um, I suspect that the people who designed pandas decided that the one that requires less typing, if I just go straight to the brackets and not have to worry about location or integer location, um, they did this because they expect this to be the one that's most frequently used. If you think about how you use a spreadsheet, if you're keeping a budget in Excel or something, a lot of times you want to add up a bunch of numbers quickly or find the median or find the largest number. And so this, I suspect that they thought this would be the one that's most frequently used to extract a column and get some data about it. So I think that's why they chose using um, the column header here as a the, the one with the shortest access. And just for some examples of that, uh, quick access, if I want to take the scores and figure out the max score, I can just call the max function on it. Or if I want to get the median or the average mean, I can get the average score, I can get the minimum score, uh, I can do all kinds of things. Um, so just as an example, I can just easily extract a column and compute some statistics about it. Okay, now let's take a look at accessing a single cell from the data table. Um, so just a quick review, here's my data frame. Suppose I wanted to look up who's in row B, uh, what their name is, or suppose Bob scored some extra points and I wanted to locate him and give him some bonus points. I only want to access just his score, not the entire column of scores. So to do that, um, I'm going to be taking the data frame and using the location, again, just like I was just doing. But in this case, I need to give it two things to get both the row and the column. And Pandas made the decision that the row data is going to come first. So if I want to look up and see the name of the person in row B, I need to go with row B first and then tell it I want the name. And that should return Bob for me. If I want to take a look at Bob's score, then I need to know that he's in row B and look up his score, which I actually made plural, scores, and that's 10. All right, now if I go back and I suppose I want to actually reassign his score, I can do that here. I can say, Bob, actually, so right now he's got 10 points. We're going to go ahead and give him some more points. So let's give him 12 points. Uh, and then I can go back and look at the table again and, and run that and see that Bob now has 12 points. Uh, in addition, another cool feature is that things like plus equals also work. So if I plus equals three more points, he had 12. We run this again, and now he's got 15 points. All right. Um, so that's uh, access with location. We can also do the same thing with the uh, integer position. So in this case, I'll still need row data and column data. So if I want to see who's in the last row, uh, I can get their... Uh, the last row is going to be minus one. If I want to look up who it is, their name is in integer position column zero, or the first column. So that's going to be Dan. And again, if I want to go back and give Dan 
an extra two points. I can go ahead, he's got nine. We'll give him two more points. And now see that he should indeed have 11 points. All right, so very cool. That's how we're gonna access individual cells. Uh, so next up, suppose I wanna actually take a slice of the data. Um, very valuable for working with um, like subsets of the data, subsets of tables. Uh, for example, uh, when we took a, a series and we sliced it, or we took a list, it's gonna give us a set of contiguous data elements, things that are touching each other, things that are all still in a row. Now, what's that mean with two-dimensional data? Essentially, what it's gonna do is it's gonna give us a rectangular section of the table. So for example, suppose I wanted to cut out uh, the two rows here with Bob and Cindy. Uh, I can do that by slicing. In this case, I'm gonna do that first with the integer position because slicing works really well with integer data. Uh, so in this case, I need to give it row data first. So that's gonna be beginning at position one, continuing to position three, but not including position three. And then I want all rows, so that's from zero to the end. I don't actually need to do zero to the end. I can leave off the zero if I want everything. And so that should give me just a subset of the table with rows Bob and Cindy, okay? So then, um, quick example with, uh, if I also have the power to slice the table with just regular location, in that case, um, to get rows B and row C, this kind of surprised me. I can actually just put in the exact names. So whereas here rows one through three did not include the three that was excluded, um, both of these endpoints are inclusive when I do uh, slicing with the location. And I don't know why the designers of Pandas did it this way. Uh, why would they make both of these access versions a little different? I'm not sure. Uh, I was surprised to see it. So just be warned that that's it. They're not exactly the same. Um, so choose whichever one you want. They are a little different. All right, now suppose I want to go back, and Bob and Cindy were partners, and I want to give both of them five more bonus points because they did an excellent job. So instead of uh, what I'd like to do is plus equals five points to their scores. Now I don't want to add five to their names. I just want to go back and access the scores column. I can do that like this. So this is going to give me rows B and C for Bob and Cindy and add five points to their scores. Now if I go back and print out my data frame, I see that Bob now has 20 and Cindy has 15 points. All right, Pandas also lets me do that really cool access with a list thing, just like they let us do a series. So if I wanted to go back and change the score for both Bob and Dan, I can use this list access where I'm going to give it still row data my row data is now going to be a list, and I need column data. Um, so here my row data, in this case, is going to be a list. And I want rows B and row D. And if I want to print out their names, just to make sure this is working, that should be Bob and Dan. I've got the name column. There it is, Bob and Dan. If I want to take their scores and give them each some bonus points too, I'll give them two more bonus points. Uh, they did the extra credit problem. In this case, I don't want to add to their name. I want to add that to their scores. There we go. And now I can print out my table again and see that Dan now went from, he was at 11 points. Hmm, wait a second. Bob is at 20, Dan's at 11. 20 and 11. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I didn't do plus equals. I just did plus. Plus equals. There we go. And there we go, there we go. That was a lot of there you go. <clears throat> All right, so now Bob has 22, Dan has 13. That's how we do list access. Cool stuff. All right, next I wanna talk about accessing the data with Boolean series. We were able to do this with the uh, series data, the Panda series, where we'd create a Boolean series of true and false values and use those to select just the pieces or of that series that we wanted. In this case, we're going to use a Boolean series to describe or to extract just the, the rows that we want. So in this case, let's decide that we're going to give everyone who scored 15 or more points an A in the class. So we'll go ahead and extract a Boolean series. So first, let's take a look at the list of scores. 
or is plural. There it is. So 6, 22, 15, 13. Now what I can do is I can create a Boolean series from that series by just saying uh, data frame scores greater than or equal to 15. And now this should give me a bunch of false and true values, true and false. So 6 is less than 15, so false. 22 and 15 are greater than or equal to 15, so those are true. Just like that. And now I can, let's actually store this in B. So this is now a Boolean series B. And I'm going to go ahead and keep that printed out for my memory. Um, I can use that to access the, um, the different rows. So I can give this square bracket version a Boolean series, and now it'll pull out those rows. So just the rows for Bob and Cindy. Okay, we'll find that Boolean series uh, used to extract data that we want from a table is extremely powerful. And uh, let me go get a more complicated example so that we can actually take a look at um, the real power behind this, some of the features available to us through Pandas. So I'm going to pop back over to uh, our web page. I'm going to go to home. Um, okay, see the link to worksheet right here? Uh, web page didn't get updated. Let me take care of this. I'll be back in one second. All right, guys, got that fixed. The code should now be available from the web page. So here we are, Pandas 2 Lecture Week 12. Um, if I open up the link to the code, it takes us to the GitHub page for our class where we have the demo code. Um, right here, I've got the IMDB movie database that we've been working with in lab um, or for project. Uh, if I open this up, it's got 998 movies in it. Um, so we can see we've got a, uh, the title, the genre that they belong to, multiple genres, the directors, um, and then the stars of the movies. So this is what I'm going to be looking at right now. Go ahead, pause the video, go download this, and I'm going to show you how to bring it up and turn it into a data frame. Uh, do that now. Okay, so I'm back over here in Jupyter Notebook. Let me make that full screen to maximize how much you guys can see. All right, I've already downloaded the data file. It's in my directory. In fact, if I go over here to the home page, you can see it. It's right here. I can pull it up inside of uh, um, Jupyter Notebook and just look at it there as well. All right, so what I'm going to do here to bring this in is just call pandas read CSV. Then I just need to give it the name of the movie or the, the name of the file. In this case, um, Jupyter Notebook is smart enough to know that it can tab complete this. So all I need to do is type the I and then tab and didn't have to worry about remembering whether I use dashes or underscores. All right, when I bring this in, it's going to print the uh, uh, the first five rows of the table and then the last five rows with some dots. So it doesn't like completely overwhelm Jupyter Notebook. Uh, it's already in a data frame. In fact, if I were to do type of this command, it tells me that it is in fact a data frame. Not what I want to look at right now. I just wanted to show you guys that. Um, I still have all of the title, genre, director, cast, all that information is here. It's also gone ahead and added in all of the indexes. So for each row in the CSV, uh, CSV is a list of lists. So just like creating something from a list of lists, it's gone and added an index for each of the rows for us. All right, this is kind of a lot to look at. There's 10 rows here. They take up a lot of space. So I'm going to save this in a variable. I'm going to go ahead and use DF, data frame, because I cannot seem to type movies. This is my third take. Um, and then run this cell. So now I've got all of my data stored in the data frame. Okay. Now, um, Pandas data frame gives us a bunch of different functions for accessing the data to simplify it for things that are huge. The first one I want to talk about is head. And this is just going to give us the first five rows of the data. There's also tail, and that's going to give us the last five rows of the data. And both of these guys take uh, an additional argument. So if I just want the first two rows, I can do that. Or if I want the last three rows, I can give it a number there and run that one. Um, so I'm just going to leave this right there with just the first two rows. But when I post this code in the very same folder where you guys just downloaded IMDB movie data .csv, um, you can refer back to what I did and see it there. Try it out for yourself. 
Okay, so that was head and tail. Uh, we can extract years from this and, well, columns. So if I have my data frame and I want to access the year and do it like this, this is going to give me a list of years. And I want to highlight that when we brought in um, CSV files, lists of lists, before using just the regular Python, um, these would all come in as strings. So pandas is smart enough that it knows that everything in here is a digit and I probably want to use this as an integer. So it's going to automatically go ahead and convert this to an integer type. Uh, same thing for the, uh, let's see, rating is the floating point number here. Let's take a look at that one. df rating. I'll run that. They look like floating point numbers. And indeed, right there, it's converted all of them to float 64. So that's a floating point number represented with 64 bits. All right, so while I'm on the topic of reading CSV files, how to access them, what it's done with the data, I also want to talk real quickly about saving CSV files. So one of the things that I can do is I can uh, convert my data frame with all the movies to a CSV, and this will save it as a file. And I just need to give it the name of a file. So I'm going to call this movies to CSV and save it. Now if I go back over here, I can see that I have a movies to that I created seconds ago. Uh, if I open this up, it's going to give me a CSV file. I want to highlight one thing. When I brought in all of the movies, it went ahead and automatically added the index here, 0, 1 for each of the rows. And then it automatically saved those indexes that it added. So 0, 1, 2, 3. Uh, if I go back, so now I have movies2.csv. If I read that in, so pandas read csv movies2. Almost, almost. There we go. It's now added yet another column. It knows it's a CSV file, a list of lists uh, where everything, and it's gone ahead and added an extra column of index values. If I were to save this again and load it again, it's going to add a third column of index rows. So that's uh, not super desirable. So what I'd really like to do is be able to write this to a file without having to deal with those extra indexes. So in order to do that, I've got my data frame dot to CSV, and then I need to call it something. I'm going to use the same type. Oh, let's go with movies 3 dot CSV. There's the end. And then one of the things uh, I can do is give it the, the keyword variable index and set this to false. This is telling me do not write the index values when I save this as a file. So I'm going to run that and then we'll go back over here to the home page. I now have movies 3. When I open this up, all of those index values that it automatically added were not included when it wrote this down. So there's no one here, there's no two, no three. So just want to give you that uh, important tip that it's going to automatically add indexes as you go through this loading cycle, um, which is not necessarily what you want to save. Okay, so let me think. Uh, so what I'd like to do now is use this data set with all 998 entries to answer sort of a complicated question to just showcase the power of data frames. So let's see, let me think here. All right, I got a good one. All right, let's do, what is the highest rated movie that had an above average runtime? I'm just gonna write this down so I can remember it later. There we go, above average runtime. All right, if you can imagine trying to do this for P8, this would have taken 100 lines of code to pull this out. Uh, just to showcase the power of pandas, I'm going to break this down to lots of steps. It's not just one step, but um, we're going to go through this and figure this out. So first thing I'm going to do, uh, quick reminder, this is my movie data table. I've got all the movies here. Uh, runtime is one of the columns. So the how, let's go ahead and extract just the runtime series column. There it is. Okay, very good. Then, next thing I want to know is what is the average? And the function to compute the average is mean, so I can compute the mean runtime. So 113, um, let's take a look at the data table again. Does that look reasonable? 
121, 124, 17, 108. Yeah, 113 looks reasonable to me. Always good to just do those little sanity checks to make sure things still look good. Now, the next thing I want to do is be able to go through this table and say, yes, keep this one, keep that one, keep that one. Ah, 108 is less than 113, let's dump that. So to do that, I'm going to create a Boolean series that we'll use to filter this data table. So to do that, um, what I really want to know is which movies, so DF, uh, I guess which runtimes, were greater than this average runtime. So there we go. Here's all of them. Are they greater than the average? When I do this, this should give me a long list of Boolean values. True, 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 false. So if I go take a look at that table, uh, bigger than 113, true, 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 less than 113, false. Looks like this is working also. It's giving me all kinds of values. It's showing 10 of them here, the first five, the last five. I'm just going to store this into a variable. I'll print it out again so that it's still here. And I'm going to use this to filter that data table. So just like uh, I showed earlier, we can filter with the Boolean series. Um, I've got my data frame of B. And now I should find that I'm missing some movies. 0, 1, 2, yep, the fourth entry, 3, is missing. And all of these over here have a runtime longer than 113 minutes. All right, very good. I'm going to store this in another variable. Let's call it long movies. And we'll go ahead and print that out too. There we go. All right, so the next thing I want to know is what is the highest rated movie of this list? So to do that, I'm going to take long movies. And let's extract out the rating column. So I'm going to use column access and get the rating. There we are. That's all the ratings. Next thing I want to know is which one is the biggest. So the command to get the maximum rating is just max. So this is telling me that the from this list, just the long movies, above average in runtime, the highest rated movie is 9.0. So I'm going to do the same kind of filtering I just did. We're going to get is... We'll take a look at this list. We'll say, is this equal to 9.0? If it is, we'll keep it. If it's not, we dump it. So this is false, 7.0 false, 7.3 false. All right, there's still 432 entries. It's gonna take a long time if I were to go through and do this by hand. Um, and in fact, it's not in the first five or the last five. So it's in the middle somewhere. So, but here's the idea. What I wanna know is of all these long movies, I'm gonna get the rating, and I wanna know which of these are equal to the maximum. It's in there somewhere. So now I've got a whole bunch, yeah, the first five were false, the last five were false. Somewhere in here is a true, or maybe more than one true if there's a tie for the highest rated movie. So next thing I want to do is just apply this, like as a filter, long movies of, oh, hold on, I need to save this as a variable. I'm going to call it B. So it's a Boolean series. We'll go ahead and print that out too. So it's still there. We can still see that I've got all those false values. And I'm going to use this as filter to grab just all of the rows where it's a exactly equal to 9.0 rating. Ah, and I see I've only got one movie in that list. Uh, movie number 54, The Dark Knight. I did like that movie. That was a good one. And we see that it has a rating of 9.0. So, um, yeah. I got to the highest rated movie with above average runtime in just a few steps. Uh, I think five legit real steps and a bunch of me printing out some other things just to make sure I didn't screw up. Okay. I want to wrap up with one really cool feature. So I've got my data frame. This was all of the movies uh, in the whole list before I started trimming and filtering. One of the things I can do is call the function describe. And what this is going to do is it's going to go through and only look at the columns with numerical data. And then it's going to provide a whole bunch of statistical information about them for me. So, for example, uh, I've got 998 elements in the data table. That's the same for all of the different columns. It's computing the mean. Uh, I don't know if the mean year production is super important. But here we just use this value, the mean runtime, a minute ago. Um, and the average rating. We also have the max rating right here. This was The Dark Knight. That's the movie that we just found. 
um, it computes the standard deviation for us, the minimum, the maximum, and then these are percentiles. So the 25th percentile, the 50th percentile is also the median, that they're the same thing. We can see that the median year was 2014, the median runtime 111 minutes, so slightly less than the average. Yeah, anyway, this is just a really quick way to go ahead and grab a lot of stats. And in fact, this data uh, table we're looking at here is also a data frame, which means that I can go ahead and access it just the same way that I would have done with any other data frame. So let me go ahead and give this a name. We'll save it in a variable. We'll print it out again. And then I can go ahead and use the location to grab, let's say the, um, let's get the uh, median runtime. So in that case, I want the column, I'm sorry, row first, row first, the 50th percentile row, and I would like the runtime column. And that should tell me that the median runtime is 111 minutes. Uh, right there, that one. Okay, very good. That's going to wrap it up for me today. I hope everyone continues to stay safe. If you have any questions, please take them to Piazza or office hours, as always. If you have any feedback about the video production, go ahead and leave me a comment in the video, or in the yeah, in the comment section. This is on YouTube. Or um, you can use our feedback form on the webpage, and I will do my best to improve the quality. Uh, have a great day, everybody.